I, I want for us to think about this topic, the awakening, the awakening. Um, a few weeks ago, probably a month or a little more, I got a call from my sister in Canada. Well, it was her husband's birthday, and so um, I didn't remember, and I think the call was just to remind me to say happy birthday. So I spoke to him a little bit, and then he had a concern. He had he asked me a question. He said, "Are you familiar with the name Robert Weenland?" No, I didn't say Weenland. Yeah, Weenland. Not Weenland. Weenland. W e i n l a n d. And I said, "No, it doesn't ring a bell." He says, "Well." I want you to look him up. I said, why? He says, well, he has been saying some things that are appealing. So I said, all right, fine, I'll do that. Um, I was really around the computer when they called. So I just typed in Robert Wayne and did a search and found that, whoa, uh, we had lots of hits for him. Anyway, I went on his site and found that he was really a prophet. Um, he was a prophet from the Church of God International, which is really Herbert Armstrong's church that was split into, but he was with the main body, or with Armstrong. Um, so he does believe in the Sabbath and so on. Uh, but he, he said that God has given him some messages and anointed him to be a prophet. And he has written several books, but the last of which is entitled 2008 The Final Crisis. In fact, this book is free for download on his website. Um, so, you know, my brother-in-law said that he had listened to a couple of interviews and there were some audio interviews there on the site. So I clicked on one and listened in a little bit just to see what he was about. So, eventually I found out that he said he was one of the anointed ones in Revelation 11. And that the other anointed one would actually be named when things come down to a crunch. Now, according to his book, he says it will be April of this year that um, things will actually start. And he is, is, is prophesying over three and a half years, Revelation 11, three and a half years, the two places were dead, is, is prophesying that there will be a three and a half years um, war, but it doesn't start with war, but it will be World War Three. And so, I try to think about what caused my brother-in-law to become so touched by what he said. Because the truth is I wasn't touched. Was it because I had more knowledge of Revelation 11 than he does? That is possible. But I found at one time in my Christian experience, Revelation would would scare me sometimes when you look at the realities that would come. But I found an answer in Revelation that helped me to have a better perspective and to deal with Revelation in a more intelligent way. And I want you to look at that answer. It's found in Revelation itself. Let's go to Revelation chapter 3. And in Revelation chapter 3, there's something that is said in two verses. That I want you to look at because this is the key to understanding Revelation. And if you can understand what these two verses are saying, you'll understand what will happen to you when all this chaos and anarchy and so on started to start to come upon the world. Revelation 11, uh, 3, sorry. Are we there? Let's go to verses 10 and 11 of Revelation chapter 3. And if you have if you have um, marked those verses. Take a good look at them. I'm sure you'll want to do something to remember those two verses. Are we there? Revelation 3 and verse 10 says what? Because, are you there? Is that what it says? Because thou hast done what? Can't. Oh, you're not there. I don't know. Wait. Revelation chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. You're there now? It says, Because thou hast done what? Thou hast kept what? The, word. the words of my patience. I will do what?
here's what Jesus says. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation that shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the faith upon the earth. Behold, he said in verse 11, I come how? Quickly. Quickly. Hold fast that which thou hast, that no man takes thy crown. Now what does this phrase mean? The word of my patience. What does this phrase mean? Because see, what he says, if you keep the word of my patience, and it's because you do this, that I will do for you what I want to do. What is this word of my patience? Now, we did yesterday, I think somebody mentioned Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12. And what does that verse say? Here, here is the patience of the saints. Now, I'm giving you an eight. The patience of the saints and the word of my patience, what's the similarity? Patience. Patience. Now, what then is the word of my patience? It's simply the promises of God that are given to you and you patiently wait for the fulfillment. Do you see that? And he says, if you do this, if you receive the words of my patience, if you receive the words, my promises to you, the word that builds faith, it's the word that you believe in. That results in reality. What God says to you, when you accept what He says, it becomes life to you. And He says, because you have done this, I will keep you from the hour of temptation. So, when we hear of destruction to come, when we read that, some, the, the, that, that the entire world is going to plunge in to be plunged into darkness, we are not afraid. Amen. Why? We are keeping the words of His patience. Right. It's the patience of the saints that results in the keeping of the commandment. It's the patience of the saints that results in the faith of Jesus. Knowing who we are, knowing who we serve, knowing what He has promised and what He will give us. Comfortable. We are comforted, sorry, with this. And it makes us comfortable. So we are not worried. Amen. Most times when you hear of things to come, the fear is, what am I going to do? But when you know, when you are, when you have the comfort of the words of his patience, then you can bravely go forward. You there? Yeah. If we go to uh, Matthew chapter 25, we're talking about awakening this one. And, and you know, Adventists, I, I, I was born and grown a Seventh day Adventist. You know, I used to pride myself in thinking that I am one of these virgins that will not be defiled because I was born this way, you know. And I was born into an Adventist family. And so I always would think of myself as I'm one of those that were not defiled with other, uh, you know, fallen churches and stuff. Now, after you come to the realization of really what this is talking about, then you recognize that you know, you're, you're probably not there. Anyway, um, Matthew 25, does, well, I would say Adventists in general, I, I, I grew up with phrases and terminologies that I never heard in any other denomination. You know, when we talk about the, the sifting and the shaking and the, the loud cry and the latter rain and, and the, 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 love, the, the, uh, the time of trouble and the short time of trouble and the time of Jacob's trouble and all these, 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 these you don't hear them anywhere else. Sanctuary. Sanctuary. Right. I mean, others will talk about it, but not in the way we do. Um, but, Matthew 25 does talk about um, ten virgins, really, and um, the five are wise and five are foolish. I, I, I think the, the recognition of being wise and foolish was really in the end result of what they did. Right? Now, it does say, and you're familiar with the story, so we're not going to read. Um, it talked about something happening that led to a certain condition. 
These virgins came for a wedding. But when they came, the bridegroom did not 